I missed casual Friday, so I thought I'd catch up. Um, actually, I wore it on purpose. Um, some time ago, Chris Warden had a t-shirt like this, not this one. I didn't take it off of her. She had one like this, and I read it and thought, now I'd wear a t-shirt like that. I don't know if you can read it or not from there. But it says, it's not religion, it's a relationship. Um, so she went out and bought me one. <laughs> And I've been waiting for the appropriate time to wear it. And that's this morning. Um, last, uh, last week, we, or I attempted anyway to finish up Colossians chapter 4. And if you're, if you're keeping track, if you're reading your Bible, if you're familiar with it, you'll, you'll know that Colossians chapter 4, that's the last chapter of Colossians. And as in Paul's normal uh, writing style, uh, at the end of his letters, he has personal notes. Uh, greetings to people uh, that uh, that are receiving the letter and and other saddies with just those casual and I was tempted I wanted to do the whole of chapter four last week and as is normal for me I went long and didn't finish and and finally quit but in fact this this ending of chapter four uh, are personal remarks and they're common among Paul's letters and I was going to just tag a few minutes on to the end of it and decided that I didn't have even a few minutes that I shouldn't do that and I am really glad that I didn't that I didn't just gloss over some people's names and things that are irrelevant as far as doctrine. Um, because I spent a little more time with it and I realized that in our lives, God never does anything significant that he doesn't gather in and use a number of people. Um, these, he's, he does that on purpose. Um, and, and this kind of tells that story that I didn't miss, but I didn't realize the significance of it. And the application, I said, the, um, I was in school uh, learning how to, let me, okay, let me impress you with another one of those, learning how to exegete uh, a passage which means understand and explain it in normal language. Um, I, I learned that it's important to see and to make the application. A good message, depending on who you listen to, um, and if you read some of the old greats like Spurgeon and so on, you find out pretty quickly that 
Yes, doctrine is absolutely important, and we need to be correct and understand the doctrine that God has given us, those things that he has told us. But at least 50% of a message should be application. Some go further than that, that a good message should be 75% application. In other words, what has God said, and what difference does it make in our lives? Charles Stanley, I, I love the way he expresses it. He goes through the passage that he's working with and then says, so what? Kind of a, kind of almost a rude statement. But the point is, is if we don't make application of it, it's just knowledge. And we can have knowledge of all kinds of things, of woodworking and heart disease and, you know, we can have knowledge, but so what? And the so what comes down to what difference does this make in our lives? And if this is, this is Paul's application of these people are important in my life. The application for us is these people are important in my life. Can you say that? Do you say that? These people are important in my life. And what God is doing in my life, hopefully in your life, always involves other people. God never does anything significant that he doesn't involve lots of people. Bring people together. Why is that? Why would he do that? That's all right. That's kind of a rhetorical question because I have an answer prepared. I just kind of put you on the spot. <laughs> it's because we're family. Amen. The shirt. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Our relationship is with our Savior. Here. And because of that vertical relationship, our horizontal relationship needs to have just as much care because it's about relationship. Not just with our Savior, but with our brothers and sisters. If they're brothers and sisters, then it's family and it's relationship. Let me read this. Uh, starting in uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. I want to read it to you. You can read along or just listen and, and follow along. Uh, and I, if I stumble over some of these names, don't snicker. You would too. <laughs> Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. 
Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Aeropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greeting to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Not a lot of great doctrine there. Um, not uh, a point to be uh, discussed and bantered about by theologians. Um, just nice greetings, thoughts, tenderness. I've got a couple of, more than a couple, actually. In this list, there's 10 people. Nine men and one woman. Is that significant? No, we just noticed, that's all. Three Jews and seven Gentiles. That important? Mm, no, not particularly, because this is the church. Two, two of the list out of ten had conflict with Paul. Two were writers. One was a professional. One known for his prayers. One was a slave. One was very well known more than the others. One was completely obscure. Nine of them persevered and one quit. You look at this list of people and and Paul speaks glowingly and warmly about all of them. I, did, I, I don't know about you, but when I was looking through this and, uh, and spending more than just casual time with it, but, to, to, but thinking about it, thinking deeply, what, what does all of this mean? What does this have to do? And, and the more I thought about it, I thought the only more diverse group than this were the 12 disciples. Um, but you know what I noticed here? Is as Paul, Paul loved these people, no matter how diverse they were, just like Jesus loved the twelve. Jesus loved the twelve, even, even though one of them he knew was going to play a part in his suffering. It starts to become a, a very interesting and amazing kind of a list. Um, in verse 7, the, the very first one, uh, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now that's a glowing report. 
there's, there's somebody who at the end of their life can say, I finished the race. I did it well. Tychicus uh, was, if you, if you will, he appears in Scripture uh, in the New Testament a couple of other times, but... <laughs> And, and I didn't mean this in a, to uh, degrade him at all or whatever, but Tychicus was Paul's mailman. He, he delivered... He's, remember, there was no mail system. Things were different then. Paul wrote a letter to some people that he'd never met from prison. <laughs> I was going to say, imagine. But no, they didn't have any glue either then. <laughs> but he had the letter. And it needed to go over there and he was in prison. Tychicus. A faithful minister. Would you take this to Kalashi? Would you take this to those people? Tychicus said, sure, that's what I'm here for, is to serve, to help, to be a part of what's going on. What a great attitude. And he not only did that uh, when Paul asked him to go to Colossae, you know what else? When Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesian church, who did he call on? Take a kiss. I got another job for you. Would you go here for me? Would you go there for me? Would you do this because of the love of Christ? Uh, I'm not completely sure. I, it's, a, it's a little bit cloudy, um, but I think he also delivered the letter Titus to Titus, too. Paul's mailman, a faithful servant, somebody who was there at his side that was willing. My, how the church needs people like that today. People who are just there but willing. Whatever needs to go on, whatever needs to happen. Just willing. In verse 9, uh, he is coming with Onesimus. Recognize that name? He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Um, that's a couple of things. If, uh, if you don't recognize the name Onesimus um, out of the book of Philemon, Onesimus was a slave. Not only was he a slave, but he was a runaway slave. He ran from his master. In that world, a runaway slave that was captured, that was a death sentence. In the letter Philemon, Paul, or I don't know, I've, I've struggled with how to even say this. Um, did Onesimus find Paul? Did Paul, Paul find Onesimus? Or did the Lord it, it crash their lives together? I, it, it, the Lord was responsible, however you want to say it or put it. Onesimus was a runaway slave. Paul was an evangelist. And Paul gave him good news. The good news. And Onesimus became a believer. And as a believer, as a runaway slave, he could be killed automatically with no questions asked. As a believer, 
Paul says, now that you're a Christian, you need to go back. Go back? Are you crazy? I'm free. But you're now, you're a slave of Christ. Now you're a slave to Jesus. And you need to go back. But when you go back, I'll write you a letter. And Paul writes him a letter <laughs> and says, accept him back now as a brother, not as a slave, but as a brother. And here, in verse 8, it says, I am sending him, he's talking back to, about uh, Tychicus, to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Who's one of you? He ran away from his master in Colossae. And he's going back. God asks us to do some very hard things in our lives. I don't, I don't know where God has taken you or where your journey has, has been. But have you ever had to go back? Go back to some place earlier in your life, make amends, offer apologies, humble yourself to somebody that makes you grit your teeth. our faithful and dear brother. That's Onesimus. In verse 10, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Paul's in prison. Aristarchus is in prison with him. Another one of those, those things that you don't want to miss because it's... This is not the first time that he's been in prison with him. Paul goes to prison. Aristarchus goes to prison with him. Um, in Acts 13.13, 13, if, you're, if you're familiar with it, you'll remember it. If not, let me describe it um, to you. Uh, excuse me, not Acts 13, Acts 19. Um, they, they're in Ephesus and there is a riot. <laughs> There's a riot around them. Um, and, uh, and the law comes and, and says, um, for your own safety, <laughs> we're going to put you in prison. And Aristarchus is there at his side and goes to prison with him. What kind of a friend does it take to go to prison with you? Frankly, I can't think of anything that would scare me or, or stretch my faithfulness, my thoughts, my belief, my trust, than to go to prison with someone when you haven't done anything wrong. It's one thing to suffer for doing wrong. It's another to suffer for doing what's right. Can you, do you get, do you, are you starting to get the feeling here about why Paul ha, 
has these people that are special that he bothered. At the end of his letter, he mentions these people because they're dear to him. These are people who have given up their lives, not only to Christ, but for the message and, and to serve alongside of the greatest evangelist that ever lived, Paul. This is not just a, uh, a, a list of obscure names. Um, the verse 10 again, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. A um, couple of things to realize or to know. Uh, Mark uh, wrote the book of Mark, the gospel according to Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Mark. Um, and he's the cousin of Barnabas. Um, Barnabas, uh, one of the one of the great figures out of the New Testament uh, that is just a, a loving, compassionate guy, a friend of, of Paul's. Uh, and then after that, it says, uh, in parenthesis, it says, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Well, that seems kind of benign. I mean, if he comes to you welcoming him, well, I mean, you know, this is an evangelist and this is a friend of mine and, and he's writing to the church and he says, if he comes to you, accept him as, well, why would we not? Well, there's a reason why they might not. And there's a reason he has to say this, or he wants to say this. And there is a reason that he says, welcome him. It's because Mark, also known as John Mark, um, in Acts 13, on Paul's first missionary journey, Mark went with him and turned around and went home in the middle of the journey. It doesn't give us a whole lot of, of descriptive language or why or reasoning or whatever. I suspect Mark probably was lonely or homesick or, excuse me, immature, um, not ready for the hardship of it. It wasn't because he deserted the faith. It wasn't because he became a heretic. He... He stopped and he went, went home. He went back. But Paul said he deserted us. And the us in that case was Barnabas. Um, that's in Acts 13, 13. Um, and a little later on in Acts 15, we see Barnabas and Paul. Uh, Barnabas getting ready to go on a second missionary journey and Barnabas, Barnabas, who's a friend of Paul's and a co-worker, but Mark is his cousin, and Barnabas being the soft-hearted, giving kind of soul that he is, says, let's get John Mark and take him with us. And Paul says, uh, uh, -uh. he deserted us once and not doing that again. Barnabas and Paul had such a falling out over this that they split company. They parted company. Barnabas got John Mark and they went one way and Paul went another way. So there was a real division there. I mean, it was, this, is, this is not the small time. This is, this is big stuff. And then over in 2 Timothy, I just happened to have it marked. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Um, 
I have it, but I, and I kind of marked it, but I lost it. Um, oh, in verse 11, <laughs> I don't know why God does that. God really does have a sense of humor. What I'm looking for is on this page, but it starts on this page. One word, only, is on this page. The rest of it's on this page. Only Luke is with me. Paul speaking, only Luke is with me at this point. He says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Restoration, forgiveness, repair. Would Paul have gotten to that point if Barnabas had not pressed the issue so, uh, so hard? Don't know. We'll never know. But what we do know, though, is, is that God uses people in our lives and in our situations, and he blends us together. And even the difficult things in our lives, the things where we irritate each other and rub against each other, God uses that for good. Remember that the next time you grit your teeth and go... God's, God's using you. <laughs> or he's using him and he's molding you, one or the other. <laughs> You're a diamond in the rough. And when a diamond is in the rough, it takes a guy with a hammer and a chisel to make it beautiful. A hammer and a chisel in your life. I did, verse 11. Jesus. Different Jesus. Don't get confused. Jesus was a popular name then as it is now. Jesus, who is the Christ, is our Savior. This is Jesus, who is called Justice. Handy to have a second name, huh? Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. Um, the interesting thing about him, got, got a, a very valuable name, Jesus, and we know absolutely nothing about him. There's absolutely nothing else in Scripture except that phrase right there. Jesus, who is also called Justice. Well, I, I take that back. Maybe there's one more thing that we know about him. Because right after that it says, These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have proved a comfort to me. So Jesus, who was justice, was a Jew, and he was a comfort to Paul. How do you become a comfort to somebody else? By not being an irritant. That would be the first place to start. Being a comfort. I didn't, it's not something that I can stand here and tell you how to do and what to be. I didn't, right here in our own little corner of the world, there's a sign down at the hospital. And it's not even out in the, for the public's view. It's out in the hallway behind where you check in. And it says, in a country where you can be anything you want to be, choose to be kind. Isn't that good? Yeah. In the back hallway of our hospital. <laughs> How come it's not on the front door? Jesus, who is called Justice, a Jew, 
who knew and appreciated and comforted Paul. In verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. Epaphras. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about him either except what Paul puts in right after this about him. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Think about your prayer life. I'll think about mine and we'll not point fingers at each other. Would you describe your prayer life as wrestling on behalf of somebody else, of other people? Maybe working a little bit, um, but wrestling in prayer. Remind you of, of Jacob wrestling with the with the angel he's not going to let go until you bless me and, and and that's the idea i think i get here and it would seem appropriate because paul was certainly familiar with the old testament is very well versed in in the old testament and would have been aware of that and he used that expression to describe this fellow wrestling in prayer for you would you, how would that make you feel if you knew someone was wrestling in prayer? You don't wrestle for 10 seconds. If you're wrestling in prayer, it takes time. You're struggling. You're putting effort and energy into it. Epaphras. That's what he was known for. That's what Paul, Paul <laughs> admired him. Now that's saying something. If Paul were here today, would he admire you? Would he admire me? I think not. I think he would love us. I think he'd have a lot to say to us. But I don't think he'd admire us. Epaphras, people that God had blended together in Paul's life and in the circumstances in place. Epaphras was a key element of that. He wrestled in prayer. He became an example for all of the others, for the other nine in this list. Or maybe ten if we include Paul. Verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor. That's why we know that Luke was a doctor. Yeah, it's the same Luke that wrote Luke and the book of Acts. He was a doctor. Paul's traveling companion. Paul's personal physician. Well, Paul must have needed it because God provided it. And then there is Demas, sends greetings. There is Demas. Um, I, I put a little sticky note on 2 Timothy chapter 4 so I could flip over to it easily because we were already there in 2 Timothy chapter 4 um, verse 11 um, talking about Paul and Barnabas. Well, the very verse before that is 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 and it says, for Demas... The only other place that Demas is mentioned. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Just like the Lord had a traitor in his midst, Paul had Demas. 
Demas didn't abandon him like Mark, who just kind of went home for whatever reasons there were. Demas, because he loved this world, he deserted him. He turned on him for the love of this world. And then there is finally just one more name in that list. The only woman. And even that is kind of suspect, I guess, because in some manuscripts it's a nympha, and in other manuscripts there's an S on the end of it in nymphus, and it, it, nympha could be female, nympha would be male. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty reassured that this is, this is a, a, a woman. Uh, give my, in verse 15, give my greeting to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and, and the church in her house. They didn't have nice buildings like this. The church was new. They didn't even have it well or, that well organized. And if they did have it well organized, they didn't want to advertise it because they were being persecuted half of the time anyway. So they met in, in homes, the buildings that they did have. Some of you are given to um, hospitality as a gift, way more than, uh, than others. For others, it's a real strain. It's difficult to open up your home and have, have lots of, for other people, it's just, <laughs> I, I love it. People like that, you can walk into their house and feel like you're in your own. I don't know, it's special. This must have been who Nympha was. The church in her house. People gathered in her house because of her hospitality, and they gathered together to worship. And I'll bet, just like any other house of worship, I'll bet during the week there were people dropping in and, and going back and, and wanting to leave a message for so-and-so or, or all of the goings on amongst the, within the church. Just opened the front door. This is, she's the one that left the key under the mat. Yeah. If I'm not here, there's something cool to drink in the refrigerator. You know, that kind of, of person. I don't know about you, but we could have skipped over all of this and said the last part of chapter 4 is, is just greetings and, and, and people's names. I'm glad I didn't. I hope I didn't bore you with it. I hope it hasn't been a, a labor to go through it. Ten people that God put together as a team team to be appreciated and function together. It's a family. The church is not a religion. It's a relationship. The relationship between us, between people. And the people that are involved in the relationship, if they're submitted to Jesus Christ, Gee, that sounds like the church. That's what the church is supposed to be. Christ, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we are submitted to him. We follow him. We work together in each other's lives, hopefully, kindly, supporting each other, filling in the gaps, filling in the places that where there's need. You need to go here. Would you go for me? You need to go there. Would you, would you take this with you as you go? Would you open your house so that we can meet here or there? And, and by the way, here's your example of how to pray. But it, learn to love people the way this fellow did. You get the you get the idea. This is and Jesus said, 
love one another. Love one another. Don't pick. Don't bite. Learn to tolerate and accept we're all individuals. We're all different. There's, <laughs> there are, there's things about us that, you know, I, I, I kind of like that, that statement of, um, you know, they love me warts and all. Um, we need to learn to do that with each one of us. I don't want to stand here and start going through the, the list of differences and the things that are weird and, the, you know, stuff. Because that's what it is. It's all just stuff. Love one another. Can you do that? I think that's why Paul put this in here. He didn't put it in here and then, and then say, now follow this example. He didn't do that. He just gave us an example. He just unfolded it in front of us. Pick your person. Pick the person out of this list of 10 or 11, including Paul, if you want. Find what God is wanting to do with you. What part you play. There's nothing more important in this world than the spread of the gospel, the good news. Are you going to be part of it? Or are you going to let the parade go by and just enjoy watching it? Lord, there's no extra words <laughs> in your word. There's no extra words in the Bible. They all have meaning. They all have purpose. They all have something to add to our understanding. They all have something to add to our lives, to enrich it and to encourage us and to make us into the image of Christ for others here on earth. So, Lord, um, Maybe it's a labor to go through and to dig out and to find all of what's going on in these verses from Scripture of people we've never met, people of thousands of years ago, but people who served a purpose then and whose lives still serve purpose today. Lord, may we see and absorb this picture, this picture of the church, and find our direction, find your leading in our lives. And then, Lord, empower us, each one of us, as we deal with our past and our struggles and the things that are difficult for us, but keep moving in the right direction, the relationship not a religion, not based on performance, but a relationship, a loving relationship that we entered into because you paid the price and then we were able to love the way you want us to because you taught us how. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We want to be a disciple and to follow you and to be valuable. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen.